Okay, standards are being launched in a very different regulatory environment from last year, from six years ago when I joined the, the GDC. There are now different expectations of dental professionals. We're in a world post the Francis report, and while, and I'll make the point again, while that was an inquiry into mid-staffs and took place in, uh, in England, the lessons and implications will apply, I would suggest, across all the four countries in the UK. So we have developed an action plan um, which will be regularly reviewed and updated to take account of external development. So we'll be looking at UK government's response to the Francis report, the Berwick review of patient safety, the Keogh report into acute hospital trusts, again published in England, and the Cluid Heart review of complaints. Now, as Director for Scotland, it's something I'm acutely aware of speaking to Scottish audiences and speaking here tonight. A lot of these reports may have started as a result of developments, um, I was going to say south of the border, but that's when I'm at home, uh, developments in England. But I would say, again, the implications will run right across um, health professionals throughout the UK. I, I was involved in planning a, a big regulatory conference in Scotland in November, and it was very clear that everybody was keen to discuss the lessons from the Francis report, even though it took place in a different jurisdiction, because the lessons and the implications would spill right across all the team. We've got a timeline for, or developing a timeline for delivering this action plan, and we'll continue to review how we meet the challenges set out from Francis report and the other reports, and how we've taken on the lessons that have been learned. The new guidelines, the standards, mapped out against the recent Francis report into mid-staffs put a particular emphasis on the culture and values of the profession. What I'd like to do now is introduce Janet Collins, our Head of Standards, and she'll be talking about the new standards for the dental team, how they were developed, and she'll explain some of the changes. A key component of the development was patients and the public. Uh, we had extensive consultation and workshops, and the new standards have patients and the public at their heart. The nine principles were drafted as GDC research revealed that of the patients who've considered complaining about someone in the dental profession, almost 30% didn't know where to start, more than a quarter didn't know how to get the information they needed, and a fifth didn't believe their complaint would be investigated. So there was some very significant findings in the research. So with that, I'll hand over to Janet. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, everyone. And I'd just like to echo um, Ian's thanks to you all for turning out after a long day at work. Um, the standards as they now stand were launched in September of last year, but we didn't just sort of dream them up. They were the result of a lot of research, a lot of collaboration, and an awful lot of discussion. Some of you may have been at one of the very early workshops that we did in Belfast when we asked registrants to come and tell us what they thought of the standards as they were then. We started the process by talking to patients. Um, not something that had happened before when we were creating standards. And we asked them what they expect from their dental professionals, what they want when they go to the dentist. And we followed that up by talking to registrants and we asked them the same question. What do you think your patients want when they come to see you? And actually, I'm pleased to report there was a lot of agreement between the two lists. It wasn't completely the same, but there was a lot of agreement. We talked to other stakeholders, we talked to fitness to practice panellists, we talked to the defence organisations, we talked to our own staff about the queries that we receive. And we commissioned external research companies to speak to particular groups. We took all that information, we tried to absorb it, we worked through it, discussed it, and drafted the new guidance. 
there was then quite a lengthy iterative process of toing and froing, checking with people. Uh, I think the version that actually was published was version 18, so there was a, there'd been a lot of toing and froing and discussion. Not surprisingly, I suppose, the research revealed that the two most important things to patients were communication and cost. And to, when, when talking about cost, transparency about cost was really important. The, most, the, the thing that came across as being most important to registrants um, was that, and this actually quite surprised us, they wanted more prescriptive guidance. There was a bit of a feeling that the previous guidance as it stood was a bit too woolly and didn't always make clear what was expected. This slide summarises some of the research that was done with the patients and shows what they came up with as being most important to them. There were probably no major surprises on there, um, but the thing I think that, that, that stands out is that, you know, cleanliness, good knowledge, dentists who know what they're doing, absolutely, no surprises. The thing that, that, that drew our eye, I think, more was the fact that three of the main issues that came out all related to communication. Explaining things well, treating patients with dignity, and involving them in decisions about their treatment. Um, this quote here, this, this gentleman from, the, uh, from a Polish men's group that, that we spoke to summarises it quite nicely. Patients should understand what's going on, how much it costs, and is it going to be painful? Those were the, those were the, th the three main things. After all the research, what did we come up with? Well, there's one document for all registrants, and the reason that that's worth pointing out is that we did ask in the research whether there should be separate guidance. Seven different registrant groups, slightly different emphases, slightly different concerns. Should we do different guidance? And there were mixed views about that across the profession. Some people thought yes, some thought no. But overall, we came down on the side of no because we felt it was more important to emphasise that the dental team is just that, a team, all working together for the benefit of the patient. Um, the design is different, sounds like a little point, but we hoped it would be quite significant. It's designed to feel like a handbook, to, like, like something you can actually use and refer to and we put notes pages in the back in the hope that people would think, oh, actually, that's interesting, that's worth scribbling down, and, and actually use it as a real kind of living document. In order to keep it relevant, we've moved all the additional guidance online, which makes it much easier for us to update and add to the additional documents as issues change, new issues come up, different emphases happen. The main thing that is really different is the focus on patient expectations. That's completely new. And the language in response to the feedback we had from registrants is much more prescriptive. Um, the old guidance was based around principles and things to take into, into account when making decisions. The new guidance says must, you must. It's, it's much more sort of cut and dried. Not completely, there are still a lot of shoulds, um, and I'll, I'll come on to talk about those in a moment, but we did go for much plainer language, we hope. And finally, a greater focus on communication, reflecting what the patients had told us about how important that is. There is a greater focus on that and about transparency. So hopefully you've all seen this. This is what the, new, what, what the new document looks like. Each of the nine principles starts with a set of patient expectations, which set out what patients told us they want in relation to whatever issue the particular principle covers. And the content of these was taken directly from the patient research. There then follows a set of standards, 
which registrants must adhere to in order to meet those patient expectations. And each standard is then accompanied by guidance which sets out more information about how you go about meeting the standard. The guidance, as I've said, is considerably more prescriptive. That has met with a mixed but largely positive reaction, and it was, as I say, in response to registrant feedback. Um, there was a view that, as the regulator, we can erase people from the register if they don't comply with the guidance. You can take someone's livelihood away, and yet the old guidance, some of the feedback said, didn't actually make clear what those expectations were that people were expected to live up to. So we've, we've tried to really focus on that much more and make it much clearer. However, that does not mean that there is no scope for professional judgment. That will always be there, and that will always be something that, that registrants should do but it's within the framework set out by the standards. We've used must, as I've said, and we've also used should. And although that might sound a little bit woolly, we've put it in for two main reasons. One, where a duty wouldn't apply in all situations. And secondly, where we're setting out how you would go about carrying out one of the musts. The, as I say, the reaction to that was a little bit mixed, but on the whole, the registrant focus groups that we tested it with did welcome the more prescriptive language. I particularly like that, the quote there from the, from the dental nurse, must is definitely a good word to have. You see that and you pay attention. And that's what we wanted. We wanted it to be clear. Another thing that some of the feedback had said was that some registrants still perhaps didn't understand the very, very direct link between the standards, which to some registrants appeared to be what the GDC thinks I should do, and fitness to practice. Um, some trainers, for example, told us that their students just didn't get the fact that, that actually it wasn't a, a nice to do. There's a very direct link between how well you do this and whether or not you stay on the register. So we've tried to make that much clearer. There are nine principles now. Um, and most of them echo what was in the previous guidance. That's, it might sound a bit strange to say when I've sort of talked about all this work we did, but the fundamentals of what goes on in practice and the fundamentals of what's expected of you as registrants don't really change that much, obviously. Um, there are two new principles, communicating effectively with patients and the one about personal behaviour. Communication, I've already mentioned quite a lot, um, was all, it, everything we put in there about communication was in response to patient feedback. The personal behaviour one um, is probably the most contentious. Some registrants are of the view that it is entirely inappropriate for the regulator to interest itself in what registrants do outside of work. Um, but in this day and age, particularly with the more, widespread, more and more widespread use of social media, the boundaries are becoming increasingly blurred, and they're becoming increasingly blurred in patients' minds. And one thing we found was that patients don't separate out a registrant's personal and their professional life, and therefore we took the decision that we were going to include that. Uh, going back to communication yet again, I, this is a really good illustration, actually, of how important it is. I think this is a really positive quote from a patient. You can tell that this patient thinks really highly about her dentist. My dentist is very good. He explains everything. Without even asking, he goes to great lengths to make me feel more comfortable in what he's doing and why he's doing it and what I should try to do to prevent any problems. You know, that's, I think that's a kind of a testimonial that any registrant would be happy to have. And yet, if you look at it, she doesn't mention her treatment at all. It's all about the way she and the dentist interact. 
Within that, we found that the thing that, that was on the bubble slide about patients wanting to be treated with respect and as individuals. It was clear from some of the research we did that some members of the dental team make assumptions when patients come into the surgery. We did quite a lot of research with different groups of patients with particular needs and those belonging to particular groups within the community and that really brought this out. Um, the example that, that struck home to me I think the most was patients who, who attended with a carer. The majority of patients in that focus group reported that when they go to the dentist, the dentist talks to the carer. And that made the patient very, very frustrated. And the lady who told us this experienced a similar thing, but from a different, a, a, a different perspective. She said, I think sometimes there's an assumption that you're an older lady, you're from an Asian background, you probably don't speak English and therefore they don't, they don't tell you what they're going to do. And that lady spoke very, very good English and you know, was wanted to be addressed as an individual. So, as I've said several times, much more emphasis on communication. This slide's also quite a good example of how the musts and the shoulds work. So, you should manage your patient's dental pain and anxiety appropriately. It's something that you would want to do, that you would try to do, but that may not always be absolutely achievable, even in an ideal world. But you must treat patients with kindness and compassion. Never really an excuse not to do that one. Another thing that was very important to patients um, that, that came out time and time again was treatment plans. And we asked about discussions and about written plans and actually what we found was that there wasn't really a, a preference what most patients wanted was both a good discussion about what was going to happen particularly obviously where there were options but then something that they could take away that they could refer back to so that they knew when they got home what they were having done when they came back what they what they'd had done so while we've always had guidance about treatment plans, you'll see in the new standards, they're now a must. One thing that won't surprise you at all is that patients were very clear that they wanted to know about costs. Um, they, several of them made the point that it's quite hard to shop around once you're actually in the chair. So they wanted to know upfront about costs. NHS practices in England are already required to display prices and the respondents to the research agreed that the same should apply to private practices. We did wonder if that would be unpopular with registrants. We even wondered if it was actually feasible, if it was practical, because obviously the list of treatments can be very, very long and whether actually it would end up being more confusing than, than helpful. But when we asked, out of 3,000 registrants, almost 3,000, 69% believed that clear prices would improve patient confidence. Hence, you must make sure that there is a simple price list clearly displayed in your reception or waiting area. And then we go on to talk about what a simple price list means. One area where things don't really change is consent. It's fairly obvious, it's absolutely nothing new. But the reason that, that I've put this paragraph up is to illustrate the greater recognition in the new document of the part that the whole team plays in creating a positive experience for patients. So it, it, it no longer says the dentist, da -da 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 -da. it's all members of the dental team. And that's one of the ways that we've tried to reflect the changing environment in practice and the fact that we now have the seven registrant groups, not the three that we had when the previous guidance was written. We used to have a booklet on team working which sort of made it feel a bit like an optional add-on. So that's gone, it's now one of the principles and it was clear in the patient research again that this is something that patients do think about 
and they expect all members of the team to work together to provide the best experience for them. Patients feel more confident when they know that someone is setting standards and can deal with breaches. So practices are now required to display that information. 6.6.11, you should display the following information where it can be seen by patients, the fact that you're regulated, and the nine principles set out in the standards. How you choose to do that is up to you. There's no prescribed format. But we have produced a poster, given that we are telling you that you need to be doing it. We have produced a poster. It's available and downloadable from our website, but you've also got a copy in your packs this evening. As I say, you don't have to use it by any means, but should you wish to, you're very welcome to. Ian mentioned in his introduction um, the impact of the Francis report and the Midstaff's inquiry. And Obviously, as Ian said, that relates to England, but we know that there are inquiries coming up in Scotland, which are not going to reflect well. And there's already been one in Wales. Um, I don't think any of us are immune to some of the issues that have been raised. And in the post-Francis environment, it is vital, and I really mean vital, that every healthcare professional accepts their responsibility to raise concerns. But Wimpole Street, despite what some people may think, is not an ivory tower. We do know that that is not an easy thing to do in the real world, particularly in an employed situation. It's not easy at all. And there is no point in us pretending that it is. Um, it's now a breach of the standards to accept, this is a direct response to Francis actually, it may seem a slightly strange thing to be in there, but that's why it's there. It's now a breach of the standards to accept a contract which includes a gagging clause, but it is equally a breach of the standards to offer such a contract. In order to effect real change, proper, thorough, cultural change, where healthcare professionals feel that they can raise a concern safely. It's important that employers understand that they have responsibilities too. It's all very well the regulators saying every individual has a responsibility, and that is true, but it doesn't stop there. The health regulators are being called on by the overarching regulator, the Professional Standards Authority, to produce common standards on what the, what, what's referred to as candour, openness. The PSA believes that common standards which apply to every healthcare professional across all the registered healthcare professions so that every, members, every member of any healthcare team, whatever its makeup, whatever the environment it's working in, are subject to the same standards in this area is one way that culture change can start to happen. Um, they have sum summoned, really, is the only word for it, all the regulators together to work on this, and the work on that, that falls to me for my sins, and the work on that starts next week. We, and we will be obviously keeping the registrants updated as that goes along. We will also be doing more, more research about it later this year. In my view, there is no point in us issuing a nice, well-written, beautifully crafted piece of guidance that actually won't work in the real world. So um, we have some research money to do a piece of work with registrants, which will be very small groups and or individual interviews, entirely confidential, and we want to talk to people about trying to do this in the real world and the barriers, what actually stops people from being able to do it. Because as I say, there's no point us, us telling you you have to do something that is not feasible or that you don't feel safe doing. On to the more contentious one that I mentioned, personal behaviour. Uh, as I said, some registrants still don't understand that in patients' eyes there isn't really a difference between personal and professional life 
and that what they do outside of work can impact on how they are seen by patients in their role as healthcare professionals. And we've tried to make that clearer in the new document. Uh, we've also, on a slightly negative note, tried to make clearer because there was some confusion when registrants do or don't need to report criminal proceedings to us. The additional guidance documents that I mentioned, this is the list of the current ones which are available on the website. The first four are updated versions of guidance that we already had. The two in red, reporting criminal proceedings and using social media are new, and I'll talk about those in a second. And scope of practice, um, which sort of sits alongside the standards, has now been revised in light of the decisions on direct access and is now updated and again available to download from the website. Criminal proceedings. Um, we've tried to make much clearer what we do and don't need to know about and basically it's mostly fixed penalty notices that we don't need to be told about. The guidance does go into considerably more detail and should you ever need to refer it to it and I, I profoundly hope you don't but it, it, it's there on the website and it does go into quite a lot of detail and it's, it's country specific where possible where the terminology is different we've tried to, we've tried to cover across the different. Um, the one thing I would say about that is invariably if you're not sure it is better to tell us. Um, there are a number of issues which don't or depending on the circumstances are very unlikely to result in any proceedings but signing a declaration saying that you don't have anything and then us finding out through different means that you do is much more likely to be a problem. Moving on to a slightly more cheerful subject. Um, this is what the standards now say about the use of social media. Clearly we're not trying to stop people using it, that would be a completely unfair and be trying to force a genie back into a bottle but we've tried to say do it sensibly think about privacy settings beware of what you're posting and there is a whole guidance sheet which goes into quite a lot more detail I think a lot of people still don't appreciate that no matter even if your privacy settings are good and you, you have everything restricted to friends only, if a friend of yours shares something that you've shared, that's it, it's out there. And once that's happened, you can't ever pull it back. Um, several years ago, we had a, a, a very unfortunate um, inc incident with Facebook where a group of dental nurses set up a Facebook page called Dental Nurses Who Hate Patients. Um, not, not the most edifying. The BADN acted very quickly, um, contacted these nurses and it was very quickly shut down. But patients had seen that and registrants just don't realise sometimes what the risks are. And the, those risks are very real. Uh, towards the end of last year, the NMC suspended a nurse for six months for inappropriate use of Facebook. So, you know, it, it isn't just us being preachy, it really isn't. It, 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 it is a real risk. This nurse had posted a series of fairly offensive messages on Facebook, including um, what I think can best be described as profanities directed towards the hospice where she worked. She thought only her friends would see her Facebook status, which cursed the fact that she had to go to work the next day and bemoaned how awful this place was. She initially argued when she was charged by the NMC that Facebook was a site where people go to vent and that it had nothing to do with her professional life. But after being reported to the NMC, she accepted that her comments had been irresponsible the NMC took a slightly stronger view than irresponsible. They pointed out that she had listed her place of work, that it was clear that she was a nurse, and her postings were accessible to the public, and therefore potentially to families of patients she was treating in that hospice. I mean, who knows? 
The NMC decided that her comments had been, and I quote, wholly inappropriate, that they called her, her judgment and her integrity into question, and that she had brought the profession into disrepute. And as far as I can work out, I think from the timing, um, she is still serving her suspension. Finally, the last thing that's really changed is the website that supports the standards. Um, we have a new focus on standards section. It looks a bit like the book. It's got the nine tabs. And if you click on whichever tab, there are FAQs, there are scenarios, there are case studies designed to try and bring the standards to life a bit um, and to show how they would operate on a day-to-day -day basis in practice. And there are some other learning materials as well. Um, in relation to advertising, for example, there's a checklist. In relation to um, websites, there's a checklist. I think just trying to make them more usable and hopefully a little bit more easy to apply day to day. That's all from me. Thank you very much. I am going to hand you over to my colleague Miriam, who um, is going to talk to you about the fitness to practice process. Okay, thanks very much, Janet. Um, it's interesting, I, I work for a regulator, I also sit in the council of another regulator, the General Teaching Council for Scotland, and, and rise in complaints, use of social media, it's not just common across the health profession, it, it stretches into other regulated professions. So now we're going to have a look at fitness to practice procedures. Miriam Bullock, my colleague, our policy manager, will speak about this area in more detail. But it's worth keeping in mind that in the number of, the number of complaints the GDC received increased by 44% from 2011 to 12, 2,274 cases received in 2012, compared with 1,578, 1,578 in 2011. As at the end of quarter two 2013, we had 1,441 complaints received. And in addition, 33 dental professionals were removed from the, the register in that year. So, over to Miriam. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for uh, poaching my most dramatic statistics. So please look surprised when I say those again in about five minutes' time. Um, it's lovely to see such full rooms. So thank you very much for all coming. This is, it's great to see everyone here. Um, as Ian said, uh, I'm a policy manager at the GDC, but I'm talking to you about fitness to practice today because before uh, I did this role, I worked as a casework manager in the fitness to practice department for three years, and before that, I was a caseworker. Um, in a bit, we're going to have an exercise where you're put in the shoes of a fitness to practice caseworker and of an investigating committee member. So to enable this, I just want to give you an overview of the fitness to practice process. Uh, essentially, I want to let you know what happens when we receive a complaint or adverse information, how we manage that process and what it means for the dental professional who's the subject of that complaint. So it's probably a bit obvious to summarise the fitness to practice process as investigating complaints or information that call into question a registrant's fitness to practice because I expect you all already knew more or less that that's what it amounts to. But I think it's worth pointing out that the FTP process is not a complaints handling service. We don't exist to provide redress or liaison um, and it might be worth highlighting that we are obliged to investigate any matters which we feel might pose a risk to future patients and this can mean that we decide to investigate a complaint before getting the registrant side of the story and we simply do this because we're obliged by the statute to investigate certain matters. This tends to be when we're investigating treatment but we also look at misconduct and we look at behaviour which we feel may call the profession into disrepute. So what kind of complaints do we receive and what do we look into? These are all examples of the types of complaints or information that we receive. We receive complaints from patients, other dental professionals, the NHS, the Dental Complaint Service, Counter Fraud and the Police. As you might expect, a majority of our incoming cases arise from patients complaining about their dental treatment. 
A significant proportion of the complaints we get are not within our investigatory remit, generally because they're not serious enough for the national regulator to investigate. These are screened out at what we call the triage stage, uh, which is the initial screening of any new complaint, which is carried out by a manager within 10 days of the complaint being received by our office. And last year, we closed about 40% of complaints at this early stage. If a complaint is closed at this stage, the dental professional wouldn't hear about it. If we close at this point, we don't get in touch. Sometimes we close cases with the suggestion that the patient complains to you directly, uh, and so you may hear from the patient at this point, but you wouldn't hear from us. If we decide that we do need to look further into the complaint or information, the case will be assigned to a named caseworker who will manage the investigation going forward. So when we get a complaint, a casework, casework manager might decide it's not for the GDC and they might close it. They may adjourn that decision for further fact-finding. Uh, or if they feel that it does warrant investigation, they'll assign, it, they'll assign it as a case to a named fitness to practice caseworker, of which we employ about 20. So what happens next? In a majority of the case worker, uh, cases, sorry, the caseworker will need to seek the informant's consent to proceed with an, an investigation. So assuming this is secured, the caseworker will then notify the registrant of the investigation. So this is the point at which you'd be advised that we've received a complaint and are looking into it. Because we're obliged by the statute to notify our registrant's employers of any investigation, we'd ask you to tell us who you're employed by. If the complaint's about treatment, we'd ask you to supply the patient's records. Um, we'll then send these to the National Clinical Assessment Service, whose clinicians provide a brief report giving their opinion on the standard of care provided. The caseworker will carry out any other necessary investigations, either after this or at the same time. The caseworker compiles all of this information into a report and states whether or not they think the totality of information calls into question the registrant's fitness to practice. If they think it doesn't raise a question of impaired fitness to practice, the case will be closed. If they do think it raises a question of impaired fitness to practice, the case moves to the next stage, which is referral to the investigating committee. Specific factual allegations would be drafted and these would be sent to you for your formal response. And in case you're wondering about the time scales here, we aim to complete this part of the process within six months of receiving the complaint. Now in 2012, we achieved this in 66% of our cases. But in 2013, we achieved this in 86% of our cases. So we're working hard to improve our timeliness in this area. The investigating committee are a panel of three people and are a mixture of dental professionals and lay members drawn from a wider pool. A committee convenes four or five times a month and they consider about 15 cases a day. The committee meets at our offices and is supported by administrative staff from the GDC, but the parties don't attend and this panel considers paperwork only. The questions they ask themselves are, is the allegation before them capable of being proved true? And if it were proved to be true, would this mean that the dental professional's fitness to practice is impaired? If the case meets both these tests, it will be referred on to the next stage, which is a public practice committee hearing of which there are three kinds, health, performance, and conduct. If the investigating committee do not feel that the case before them meets those tests, they'll close it and they can close it without any further action, or they can issue letters of advice or warning. So if the investigating committee refer the case onto a practice committee, our lawyers and yours will prepare the case for a final hearing. You'd be provided with the specific charges which would be considered by the panel and given your opportunity to respond. The practice committees hear live evidence from yourself and from relevant witnesses. Cases can be heard in a day or it can take several weeks depending on the volume of evidence. The practice committee decide whether misconduct or poor performance has in fact occurred and whether it means that the dental professional's fitness to practice is impaired. If not, the practice committee won't take any action and the case will be closed. If so, however, 
they can issue a reprimand, impose conditional registration, suspend registration or erase. So that's the process overall. And thinking now about the challenges that the fitness to practice department are facing. Our main challenge, as Ian mentioned, is that the number of cases we receive has increased significantly over the last few years. In 2012, we saw a 44% increase in the number of complaints received. And in 2013, we saw a 32% increase again. This increase put considerable pressure on the department as we sought to ensure that we were still taking prompt and appropriate action where necessary to protect patients and to uphold the reputation of the profession. We also recognise the need to process cases as quickly as we can for the benefit of the registrants involved. We recognise that a fitness to practice investigation is an extremely heavy burden for a professional to bear and we want to manage the process as best we can. So what steps have we taken to manage this increase in numbers and in work? One way of dealing with an increased workload is to throw more staff and more money at the situation. We, however, are not in a position to do that as our revenue stream is the ARF and we can't increase it idly. So we looked for ways to make our processes more efficient and to handle more work with the resources we have. Triage, which I mentioned earlier as the early initial screening of all cases, was only introduced about 18 months ago. Prior to that, all the complaints we received were allocated to a caseworker for initial investigation, so none were siphoned off. Bringing this decision point forward has enabled us to close about 40% of complaints at a much earlier stage. I also mentioned uh, the early clinical advice that we received from NCAS. This process was introduced just over a year ago. And prior to this, our first opportunity to receive clinical input on a case was the investigating committee, which in practice meant that virtually all of the cases that we received, which were about treatment, had to be referred to the investigating committee. That was our first opportunity to get clinical input. Getting this advice earlier from NCAS means that cases in which the clinical care is deemed appropriate can be closed much earlier, which avoids the time and expense of referring a case to the investigating committee only for them to close it on the advice of the clinical panellists. To avoid a backlog of cases and increased incomings clogging the system further along, we've increased the number of investigating committee and practice committee hearings. We've gone from having two investigating committees a month to now having five. And whereas in 2011, we had 67 practice committee hearings, in 2013, we had 159. Another cost-saving measure we took last year was to create an in-house legal services department who will take on 50% of the legal work we currently outsource to external firms, and this will bring substantial cost savings to the GDC. Having made these changes, we were then confident that any recruitment we still need to carry out would place staff in an efficient system. So last year we created an additional casework team to increase our capacity to process cases in good time. Thinking about the future, what will we do to continue these improvements? Well. We're currently bound by legislation which prevents us from building even more efficient processes. We're locked in a system which demands that we process complaints in a linear and quite inflexible way. We've gone as far as we can within the current legislation and so we're currently pushing for legislative change which will enable us to modify and modernise our procedures which will enable us to regulate in a more efficient, flexible and most importantly proportionate way. We're continuing to make our business more effective and we're borrowing methods from the private sector to ensure we run our organisation efficiently and make best use of your registration fees which fund our work. We want to improve patients' ability to make informed choices about their care and to raise concerns in a proportionate way which is not necessarily by coming to the GDC. We want to help registrants adhere to the standards we set and the standards which patients expect in order to minimise the likelihood that patients will feel the need to come to us. One of the ways we aim to do this is by increasing, improving sorry, the quality of information that we provide in our literature and our website and by events like this 
and by increasing patients' awareness of the GDC as a source of information. It would be remiss of me not to mention that having held the, registration, the annual retention fee at a fixed point for a couple of years, we're currently investigating the annual retention fee and whether we need to increase it in the future. And if it is necessary to do that, we're investigating the best way of doing this. But I'd really like to assure you that any increase we make will be put to the best possible use by funding efficient processes which enable effective and proportionate regulation in patients and in the profession's interest. We move to break. Thank you very, very much for your attention.